you so kind as to remain standing for just a moment. Uh, I'm going to bring our preacher here. He's become a great friend of our church. I just personally want to thank everybody. Elaine, Brenda, all the crews, Sister Wells, folks that, that went out of their way for Friday night for my wife and I's uh, 50th wedding anniversary. And it was such a wonderful celebration. Thank you, Brother Hino. Thank you, Alex. I think we ought to give all of them just a great big thank you for all that they did for us. And uh, just so you understand, it was my wife's will and not mine. I was asked to do it, and I said, no, we don't need to do it. But well, the high note went and talked to Sister Arnold. She said, go ahead and do it. So thank you very, very much for coming. Everybody that was able to be there, it was just a very, very... A touching and wonderful deal. Uh, you people gave us a bunch of gifts, uh, a, f a food certificate things, and we figured out if we use them all, we'll both weigh 3,000 pounds by next January. Amen. Amen. Thank you very, very much for doing that. And uh, Tammy, I saw Tammy, one of our little girls, back home with us. Thank you, Tammy, for coming. We we, we're so glad you're with us. Amen. Thank you. Remember the She's for Christ slips that we've passed out. We only do one annual fundraiser. Fundraiser. Everything else is paid for by this church. No, you don't have to pay for nothing. But the one thing we do ask you to do is let's do this thing for foreign missions, Tupelo Children's Mansion. So we're running a little late on that commitment, so we, we need you to fill them out and turn them back in. I'm holding in my hands uh, Brother Osborne's brand new book. He's got a brand new book called Dust from the Master's Feet, compilation of a wonderful sermons and teachings that he's done. He only brought 15, correct? 15, yeah, 10 or 15. That's what I paid for. I paid for. They're 15 bucks a piece. I bought them all because I need to preach these things, and you don't need to know them. <laughs> but we have them in the bookstore if you'd be interested in picking them up at the service I can only tell you from knowing Brother Osborne a number of years that anything that comes out of him is good stuff so you might want to see the bookstore after the service amen he'll be with us again tonight why don't you put your hands together the one and only J.H. Osborne Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. How kind, how kind. You may be seated. I'm thrilled to be here. Congratulations on the 50 years uh, of the Arnolds and their, and their, I don't know what 51 is. What I know 50 is golden, and then I know the first year's paper, and then I don't know what 51 is. Maybe it's styrofoam, or, or you got to start over, though, you know, platinum maybe, or I don't know what you go for 51 years. Anyway, uh, happy I am to be here. Your pastor, your wonderful pastor, is uh, uh, thankful for, for his invitation to me. He's such a revelatory preacher. He's known for that around the country. Maybe you don't know that, but he's a great uh, preacher of revelation. And uh, uh, he's, he's, he's such a great voice to this generation. Uh, you, you, know, you say, well, it's just a voice. But John, the Bible said, was a voice. He was just a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. And the Bible also said John did no miracles. But he was, the, he was the greatest of all prophets. He was greater than Elijah, greater than Elijah, greater than Samuel, greater than Moses. He was, one, he was the greatest of all prophets, yet he never did a miracle. Never did a miracle. But he prepared the way for every miracle that Jesus did. So every miracle Jesus did, you can attribute that to John. Because without John making the way for that miracle to come, why, there would have been no miracles in the book of, uh, in, the, in the epistles uh, of, of Jesus Christ in, in, in all of those books. So, you know, this voice that you have here at this church, how blessed you are to have this great voice of a man who preaches such great revelatory things. And revelation doesn't come easy. It's a, it's a painful process for God to give you revelation. John had, had walked with Jesus for three and a half years. And he had, he had actually leaned his head upon his breast and listened to the heartbeat of God. He listened to the blood gurgle through his veins before it was ever shed. He was the disciple whom Jesus said he loved. He gave, he gave Peter a lot of information, but Peter was hard to love. But John was easy to love, you know. He was easy to love. He, he, some people have a greater capacity to be loved. Maybe you have children. Some children 
just need more loving than other children do because some kids just get along kind of by themselves, you know, they can run and romp, and then there are some that are kind of clingy, you know. And so, but, but John was the one whom Jesus loved because he had that capacity to be loved. But it wasn't until after he walked with him three and a half years, he even took his mama home with him, you know, from, from the cross and, uh, and nurtured her and loved her in his home. So of all that beauty and, and opportunity that he had, but he didn't write the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ until he was some 80 years old. And that ship pierced the shores of the, that rocky crag in the Aegean Sea called the Isle of Patmos. And there he wrote the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. He didn't write it watching him walk on water, didn't write it eat and multiply loaves and fishes, but he wrote it in a killing place, in a place he thought was going to kill him. But sometimes a killing place becomes a revealing place. And rather than kill you, it reveals things to you. It shows things to you. It opens your eyes, opens your understanding. It, it gives you revelation. The revelation was not written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. In fact, he watched and saw and experienced, and he said, we handled him. But I didn't get the revelation of him until I went to my killing place. And sometimes when you hear revelation, revelation, uh, uh, Revelation is being preached to you. You understand that generally comes from a killing place. That generally comes from something in a man's life that he has suffered through. That un because kill revelation means the uncovering, and God doesn't uncover Himself to everyone. He undercovers Him. He, uh, he, he uncovers Himself to those who get to that position where their flesh is really crucified. And uh, that's why a lot of young men have trouble preaching because they haven't been to a killing place yet. And it's because in the killing place you get a revelation. You can preach what you've been told. You can preach what you've been taught, but you can't preach revelation. Revelation is when God uncovers it for you. Everything else, you're just regurgitating what somebody else said. That's why a lot of young men who have a voice of their father in their life, they can preach what their father taught. Then when their father dies, they don't have a voice in their life, and they have no revelation, so they're easily drawn away by other things and other ministries and other subjects and other things, other worldly things. And so having a voice in your life, you know how important that is, having a voice that's, that's, that has revelation locked up in it is so vital to our lives that you have that. And you're a blessed people for having that in here, here at the... Uh, Pentecostals of Gainesville. And he's my friend, and I give honor to the First Lady here who has endured him for 50 years and bore up under all the struggles and hardships and pain. She's such a, she's such a, sweet, she's such a sweet lady. And uh, for the high note, thank you, sir. I, I love him and appreciate his, his ministry here at this church. And, uh, well, I guess um, I, I need to say something here of value. If you'll stand with me, I'll uh, read a little something here to you out of the Bible. Let me take this off and get this out of the way here. That'll be fine. In the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, the seedbed of all thought and truth, Genesis 29, beginning in verse 20, a familiar passage of Scripture, but I'm kind of a storyteller. In my, in my book, all my sermons I put in story form, so they're readable. And uh, I guess this is how I, my, my, fam, my wife's family is very musical, and they're, they're just musicians. They can all sing. They can all play any instrument. When they come to a family reunion, their trunk opens up. They get every instrument in the world out, you know. They can all switch instruments. They can sing parts. They get together and harmonize, and they're just, they're just like that. They just eat up with it, you know. In my family, nothing. We can't sing. I've never seen an instrument in any home of, my, of any of my aunts or uncles or, or their children, my nieces or nephews. Never heard them ever sing. Never heard my mother ever sing. Never heard my dad. God knows I never heard my dad ever sing. Heard my mother sing in church, but she never just went around singing, you know. We just, we just weren't musical, you know. But, but they were all from Kentucky, and that's not a bad thing. It's just a fact. And uh, we'd go down there, and uh, at nighttime, you know, we'd get down there. It'd be the evening time because, like, going, going down there was like a trip to the end of the world. And uh, when we get there, they all go outside, and then we'll ladder back chairs. It's just hot inside, just hot, just 30 steps from hell on the inside. And so we'd all go outside and sit in them old ladder back chairs, and they would tell stories. So that's what I was raised. I was just raised on storytelling. They never played a guitar and sang around the campfire or anything. They just tell stories, you know. And I'm not sure they were true, but they were great storytellers because usually when you tell a story, you have to kind of, you know, you, you got you to, gotta, you know, put some jam on the bread and kind of make it a little more... And just to make the story, because the Bible's not really complete. This, there's not a story in here that's actually complete. You've got to fill in some gaps, some blanks in there, you know. That's what I'm very good at, filling in the blanks. And <laughs> I know you'll be the judge of that. So, <laughs> And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. It seemed to him but a few days for the love he had to her. 
Jacob said to Laman, Give me my wife, and for my days are fulfilled that I may go into her. Laman gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. It came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went into her. And Laman gave unto his daughter Leah Zelpha, his maid, for a handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laman, What is this thou hast done to me? Did not I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And I'll minister to you this morning. In the morning, it was Leah. Mm. Let's pray and God, ask God to help us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy, for it has followed me all the days of my life. You've been so kind and long-suffering and gentle, dear God. Now help the preacher. Give me words, dear God. You said that the, the preacher chose acceptable words. Help me to find acceptable words. For why should I preach that that would not be acceptable? Help my mind to be clear, my thoughts to be sure. Remove from my mind any doubt or any error or any confusion, Lord, that I may say or speak, Lord. I give you the praise for glory in the glory forever and ever, for thou hast done all things well. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Peter, speaking of the great apostle Paul, said that there are some things that are hard to be understood. And I second the opinion and, 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 and also say there are some things in the Bible that as a whole that are hard to be understood. I guess it's because of the time frame, the culture, the gap clouds some of our understanding. But I want you to know this morning that I believe the Bible, even though I don't always understand the Bible. If God had not been the author, I would have concluded that much of it would have been fantasy or hallucinations or fables or fiction. But the fact of the matter is, I was not there. And so if the one who says that that's how it happened, then I say, so be it, that's how it happened. Even though I don't understand or comprehend how it could have happened, I, I just accept the fact that it happened, you know. If the Red Sea rolled back by a strong east wind, I've never felt a wind that strong. But if Moses says that's what happened, I was not there, so I believe that's what happened, you know. If he says he took a stick and hit a rock and water came out of it, I've hit rocks before, but no water came out of them. But if he says water came out of that rock, then I'm, I'm going to believe that the water came out of the rock. Yeah. If the bush burned and was not consumed, I've never, I was not there to see that, but the Bible tells us that. Moses records it, so I let's say let the bush burn, you know. If the Jericho walls fell down from a shout, I was not there. I did not march with them. I did not see it. There's no, uh, but there is recorded in the Bible that on the seventh time, uh, on the seventh day when they marched around, the walls fell down flat. So I said let the walls fall, you know. I wasn't there. If the Bible says that's how it happened, I just, I just believe that. If Samson killed a thousand men with a jawbone of an ass, to me that's a stretch. It would seem like a thousand men could take one man, regardless of how big he was, unless you're like those kung fu things, just come one at a time, you know. But if all thousand men would come at one time, but if he said he did it with a jawbone of an ass, I said, let him kill a thousand, you know, let it go, let it be like that. I wasn't there, you know, so I've not had that kind of experience, but if he said that's what happened, then, then let it happen. If, if Balaam says his donkey talked to him, you know, I, I wasn't there, but... Uh, and I've been around some donkeys before, some two-legged and some four-legged donkeys. And the two-leggeds are better at talking than the, the four-leggeds are, but I've heard them whinny and bawl and, and eat briars, but I've never heard of a donkey that, that talk, but, but let it be so. But, you know, Balaam's kind of a moron to begin with because he's running after a king's reward, and you got yourself a talking donkey. Man, I wouldn't be running after nothing. I'd get me a, a pickup truck and a, and, a, and a trailer, and I'd be all over the country with a talking donkey. I'd be a millionaire before the sun came up, you know. So he's got a talking donkey, but he don't take advantage of it at all, so he's not much smarter than the donkey is. But this that I've read for you from the pages of Holy Writ is hard for me to comprehend in that I've had a wedding night and my wife has a sister. And how in the world do you pull something like that off? If I had woke up with my wife's sister, yeah, oh my God is right. I would have I woke up with my wife's sister. 
There would have been trouble. It would have been more than just what have you done to me. It would have been a, it would have been a, it would have been, I would have been a bad hombre on that night, you know. I, I can't figure out. That's got to be the all-time wedding joke, you know. A lot of times they pull tricks on people at weddings, you know. They, but I'm, this is carrying just, this, you crossed the line now. You, you went over to the other side. You can tie 10 cans on the back of the car. Or one time we put Limburger cheese on the door handles. You can, you can do some stuff, you know, that for the wedding night, but this is really beyond the pale of anything that I've ever heard of, you know, that you can, and I can't see how you could actually pull something off like this. It's easy for me to believe the whale story. Jonah found a burning bush inside the whale, and he prayed the sides of the fish down and took the whale bone and used it as a pulpit and preached to Nineveh. I, you can make it any way you want to make it, you know, but I'm, I'm, I believe the Bible, but I, I just can't. But the thing about the wedding night and, and, and having the sister of the girl you married I've had a wedding night, you know, and my wife has a sister. I, I wasn't there for the burning bush. I wasn't there for the whale story, but, but I have been in a situation like this, and I cannot fathom it actually being pulled off. You know, I'm thinking, Jacob, didn't you peek one time? I mean, all night long, you never peeked. You never opened your eyes and looked that you got the wrong woman here. You know, you never, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. How could it go all night long? And you don't see until this, I'd like to have been a fly on the wall. When, when, the, when that son come through that, come through that window and he yawns and scratches himself and rolls over and looks. And there's Leah there. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know what I would have done. You mean there was not a sign? There was not a signal? There was not a discrep discrepancy that something was horribly wrong here, you know, and he doesn't realize it till in the morning. This has got to be one of the most baffling stories in the Bible. It's the account of a man called Jacob who worked seven years for the father of the one he loved to earn the right to marry her, his daughter. And after his wedding night, when the morning light came, he looked at the woman lying beside him, and it was Leah. He had married the wrong woman. Now, the question that begs an answer out of all this is how in the world could this have ever happened? The Bible said, Paul wrote the book of Romans, for whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning. So I'm trying to figure out what am I supposed to learn from this? What is the teachable moment here? What is the lesson that I'm supposed to come to Gainesville and teach you this morning and talk to you about this morning? You're supposed to learn something. There's supposed to be some kind of experience, you know. What is being taught through this experience? I can't imagine me warning every man, be very, very careful on your wedding night. Be very careful on your wedding night, you know. But you don't wake up with the wrong woman, you know. You don't wake up with the wrong woman. Perhaps that's why we lift the veil. You know, at the wedding ceremony. Huh? Just one last check, you know, to be sure. Because, you know, a veil will cover a multitude of sins. A veil will, you know, when you're veiled. And every pride's beautiful coming down the aisle. You know, it's just gorgeous. I don't care what she may look like underneath the veil, but she's gorgeous coming down the aisle. I've never seen an ugly bride. They're all beautiful, you know. And, but the problem is we raise the veil after you've already said, I do. We probably ought to raise it when you first come down, you know, just to be sure that the person you're pledging your troth to, which you don't even know what troth is, but you pledge it anyway because you're... So what am I supposed to learn from this? What am I supposed to teach you today? What are you supposed to understand? Maybe, maybe what I'm to learn from Jacob's mistaken identity and is a little more subtile. Maybe, you know, the Old Testament's filled with types and shadows and perhaps this working for Rachel and, and waking up with Leah is a concept that can speak to our lives in the 21st century. Maybe it represents something much more common, an experience that all of us might encounter along life's way. So I want to look at the whole story. And I know you know the story, but you can't tell a story unless you tell a story, you know. And so I'll try to get through it as best I can. If there's a lesson, an experience that we can all relate to. Jacob had tricked his brother Esau of his birthright. His mother had sent Jacob to her brother Laman's house in Haran until Esau could cool off. 
He had sought, you know, he was going to kill Jacob. And Jacob was not a fighter. Jacob was a man of the tent. He could make toll house cookies, but he wasn't much of a fighter because his mama, his mama loved him and daddy loved Esau. So he come from a dysfunctional family because Jacob had a lot of nurturing, but he didn't have any discipline. Esau had a lot of discipline, but he didn't have any nurturing because you need a father and a mother in your life. And neither one of those boys had both. One had a father, the other one had a mother. And so both were lacking, both were somewhat dysfunctional in their lives. So Jacob had tricked his brother Esau. And so he goes over to the neck of the woods where his uncle lived. And Jacob said to my brother, and whence are you? Esau, some men over there. And they said, where are we? Of Haran are we? And he said to them, know ye Laban, my son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. And he said to them, is he well? And they said, he's well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for he, she kept them. And it come to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban's mother, mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob went near and rolled away the stone from the well's mouth, watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And he kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. He was somewhat of a crybaby. You know, Rachel, was, he wasn't all that strong. He wasn't real manly, you know. He, he just began bawling when he, and, and he kissed her, you know. Uh, you usually don't just kiss a girl as soon as you see her, you know. You, I mean, just, you know, you probably ought to, you know, talking roses, candy, something, you know, before you just, as soon as he saw her, he just ran kissed her, you know. And I don't know if it was on the lips or where would that make a difference, I don't guess. But there was no dating. There was no romance. There were no flowers. There were no courtship, no engagement. It was love at first sight. He was swept off his feet. Cupid's arrow pierced his heart. He fell hard. He swallowed hook, line, and sinker. She was everything he ever dreamed of. He did no comparison shopping. <laughs> He did no dating around. He didn't go into town, you know, kick a few tires. He didn't test the waters. She was it. No question about it. Here's the rub. Laman had two daughters. The name of the elder, the oldest, was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Then it, the Bible does something. It seldom does. It describes them. And Leah, and, 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 and he had two daughters. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well favored the word rachel means the you she is the you lamb she's the female she's the predominant element of the flock in this two girl flock she was the predominant one she was the eye catcher rachel was a knockout the bible doesn't say that but i'm extrapolating here she was beautiful the bible said and well favored she she was beautiful and well favored she was blessed physically you can take that what it mean whatever it means she was well proportioned she had a good figure she was easy on the eyes she had a lovely face she was perfect in her outward assets she was her she was the predominant one of the two she was the ewe lamb she was the predominant one she's the one when the two came to town she's the one you watched she's the one she was the eye catcher right, right, right. don't let me go further than this and i need to go now so <laughs> she was the eye catcher her elder sister, her name is Leah. If your name is Leah here tonight, I'm sure you're a wonderful person and a beautiful lady, but this girl was not. <laughs> her name means to tire out or to make weary, to faint, to loathe, be, to be disgusting. Her, her name carries the root word of a wild cow. So you've got the predominant, you've got the ewe lamb, then you've got the wild cow over here then you've got the predominant one then you've got the one that's tender-eyed and tender-eyed is king james for ugly she had no physical attributes to catch your eye you know she was kind of frumpy is frumpy a good word she was kind of frumpy you know kind of frumpy you know elia was not desirable her personality was to wear you out and make you dislike her she was disgusting and offensive and would cause you to lose interest in her very quickly leah was no competition for her younger sister rachel she was clingy and nagging and irritating and annoying and complaining and she whines all the time and when jacob came to the door you know leah's wearing a a, a, a John Deere ball cap and a t-shirt that says eat more possum and she's got orange and green fubu tennis shoes on and bobby socks and her face looks like 30 miles of rough road you know and so she's not the predominant one she's not the one that everybody is longing for you know she's 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 Leah she's 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 she's, she's clingy and she's irritating and she's and she causes you to lose interest in her very quickly the Bible said that Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. 
I went to, I flew to uh, California and, uh, you know, time frame is, you know, traveling, going to California and back in that neck of the woods, it's was three or four hours, you know, you lose all that time from Indianapolis, you do at least. And uh, I, I, I flew in San Francisco. Then I was flying to Eureka to the McDonald's to preach for them. Just about that far on the map, about that far. And a uh, little old plane. So we got there and they said, well, there was some girl in the airport. You know, you know, people have got a voice that just cuts through everybody else's voice. You can hear them in a restaurant somewhere. I mean, it could be noisy, but there's always some person in there that's got a voice that's like shaking a can of bolts or something. It just, it just cuts out, cuts through the fog of everybody else's talk, you know. And there was a girl in there like that. She was, her voice was like... It was just like, put you on the edge, just listen to it. She was all over the place, stepping over people's luggage and everything. She had a jean skirt on, looked like it's made out of a parachute, you know, and she's got a pair of these sandals on, they're real feminine looking. They're kind of on the, on the soles, they're like made out of a car tire. You know, they got them soles on the back. These are like road grader tires. I mean, these shoes are this long, you know. It's got these Velcro straps that go, a big Velcro all around your ankles, you know, and oh yeah, they're real feminine looking. And she's stepping over people's luggage and climbing over things, you know, and, and just talking to everybody. Where are you going? You know, just, and people, you know, people in, people in airports are kind of to themselves. They got earbuds in and everything else. And she's just all over everybody, you know. And so finally they said, we're going to board the plane. It's a little old plane, you know. And we went out there and got, sure enough, she's going with me. She's going on that little old plane, you know. And it's going to be worse than ever when I got on there. So we got on there. She's sitting in the very back, and I could hear her talking back there. And they said, well, it's fogged in. We're not going to be able to go. So everybody's got to get off the plane now and get her luggage and go back in, wait another hour and a half for the fog to lift. And finally got back on, got our luggage going. I, I can't make this story short, but I'm trying to make it medium. And so we, we got back on the plane again, and we, we got all the way to uh, Eureka, and we circled around up there, and he said, well, we can't land, it's too much fog, can't see the airport. You know, and you're in the mountains, and so I'm thinking this looks like headlines to me, you know, you can't land for the fog and we're in the mountains and he said we'll go to another airport. So we flew to another airport, fogged in also. Now he says we're running low on gas. Well this woman in the back, she's just going nuts, you know, and and uh I knew this would happen. We're all going you know, she's a real encourager. So <laughs> So we finally got to a little airport and finally landed and, and they said, you know, upstairs, this little, little bitty airport, I don't even know where it was at now, back in someplace, back in the mountains of, of California. And, 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 and so they said, we're all going upstairs because they got a, a bar up there. I said, I, I don't drink. You, you folks go ahead. Now, I want to tell you something. I'd already eat the lint out of the bottom of my briefcase. I'm starved to death. I, haven't, uh, I found little pieces of everything, crumbs and stuff, and I'm scooping it up. And, and my battery's dead because I got no signal at all. So I unplugged the ATM machine, rolled it. I could have took the ATM machine. They'd never known. I rolled it out, unplugged it, plugged my phone into the ATM machine outlet there, charged my phone up. I didn't want to get stranded there for sure. And so they finally all went upstairs, left their luggage with me. I got luggage all around me here. I'm sitting there with luggage all around me. I'm starved to death. And finally they went upstairs. Now they've all got liquored up. Now they're like a bunch of drunken sailors. They all come down their arms around one another, you know, and they're singing old Lang Syne and row, row, row your boat and all that kind of stuff, you know. And they go, oh, Lord, I got, so now we got to get on a bus and we got to go to the, de got to go about five hours through the mountains in a, in a, in a bus that looked like it wore out 20 years ago, you know, s s cushions all hanging out of it and everything. Got a driver that got up at four o'clock in the morning, so he ain't even awake yet, you know, and he's just highballing down them. Now I'm throwing all around the seats. You can't sleep or sling one side. And they're on the back of the bus singing, <laughs> driving me nuts. So finally we come to a place and all the lights came on. And we're now at the airport where we were supposed to land. And it's bright light, you know, so I, I kind of come to myself. I've been dreaming about, I won't tell you what I was dreaming about, but <laughs> I was missing Sister Osborne. And so uh, I finally roused up and got looking around. And that woman, that woman that had been in the airport, she was now laying in the seat in front of me. She laid across the two seats of the bus. Her legs went across the aisle, and then feet were sticking. It looked like Goliath's feet sticking up over here on the other side of the bus. She's laying there, you know, and she's snoring. She's loud snoring now, you know. She's asleep now. It's time to get off the bus. Now she's in, in some other zone, you know. So there's only one woman ahead of her, everybody else still in the back of the bus. So the woman comes up and says, baby, wake up. We're here. We're here. Well, this baby ain't waking up, you know. Wake up. She's got a big drool running out of the corner of her mouth, you know. And, and so, wake up, baby. Wake up. We're here. We're here. We're here. And, and, and she wouldn't wake up. And I'm standing there with my briefcase and my, and I don't want to get off that bus. I've been on it, it seems like, forever. And here she is laying down there uh, like one of them Philistines that Samson had killed. And, and, and I went off the bus, and she won't wake up.
So she started shaking her, and she would not wake up. Now, I've had about enough of this woman. I've had her ever since the airport in San Francisco. I've had her on the, on the plane. I've had her on the bus, and I'm wore out with her, you know. And I don't imagine this. If I was to lay hands on no man suddenly, but she wasn't no man, I can tell you that. And she had a, she had a, she had a great big old top on, the great big old, look, a huge top. Now, I got me a big walk. Now, I don't recommend this at all, but I, I was on the last edge you understand? I was just one edge from, from doing something you go to jail for. And, and I, I grabbed her blouse or the big old sweater thing, and I wrapped my around around. I got me a wad of that blouse. You know, I wound it up around and got it good and tight. And I shook her like a dog shaking a snake, man. I shook her. I said, you wake up. I'm telling you, you wake up right now. I shook her, and she would not wake up. And I asked that woman. I said, what's her name? And she said, Leah. And I said, I said she said, said, Leah. I went to sleep thinking about Sister Osborne, and I woke up with Leah. And I could not get her awake. I took my suitcase and threw it over top of her. I don't recommend this, but I, I stepped over top of her. I got off that bus. So I have a little, I have a little feeling for Jacob. So I guess Rachel represents everything beautiful that we work for and we strive for and everything we dream of having or accomplishing. The Rachel is a dream come true. She represents beauty that's beyond our expectations. I mean, we kiss her the first time we see her because we know that she's the one. Our hearts leap for joy and life is good and life is fair and life is full of joy and life as well rewards our efforts. We've worked 14 years. Our plans all work out just as we expected. Our life is on track and, you know, tomorrow's full of hope. Our beautiful dreams all come true. Time flies. Seemed like just a little while that he had to work for her because, you know, time flies because our well-favored future is bright and attractive. We reach all of our goals without strife and struggle. And, you know, certainly Rachel is easy to love. But Leah represents you know, disappointments and, and hurt and pain. And she represents, I guess, broken dreams and broken hearts and wasted time. And she's a type of, of frustrations and depression and, you know, shattered expectations and all of our canceled plans and empty promises and false hopes. I guess she represents, you know, trickery and deception and lies and beguiling spirits and tiredness and weariness and faintness and everything in your life that's disgusting. How often has it been in mine and your life, that we thought we had Rachel, the love of our life. But when the morning light came through, there was, there was Leah. Lovely, well-favored Rachel turns into tender-eyed, disgusting Leah. And every dream and every plan and every purpose is shipwrecked on a sea of lies and deception because you work so hard for Rachel. And then one morning, there's Leah. Remember, Leah like so many of life's problems and disappointments, is never an invited guest, but always an intruder. She's never welcome. She represents situations and circumstances that really turn your world upside down. The Bible says that Jacob hated Leah. He hated her. He didn't just not like her, or think she wasn't nearly as pretty as, as Rachel, but the Bible is very clear, Jacob hated her. He had a passion against her because she represented everything that he despised. She was like some sort of addiction, some kind of drug or alcohol, like divorce, abusive relationships, bad choices, poor decisions. You know, you never start out to marry it. You just wake up one morning and, you know, there it is. And it attaches itself to you, and though you despise it, it lingers there in the shadows of your life. It becomes an inseparable part of who you are, and you really do hate what has happened. How could this possibly have happened to me? Well, it was a setup. It was a trick of old Satan himself. It was a bait-and-switch move that is as old as time. Genesis says it came to pass in the evening. Then he took Leah, his daughter. He waited till the sun had gone down. He waited till the shadows had lengthened. He waited till the light was very dim before he would bring her to him. 
knowing that the darkness would somehow conceal the trickery. Somehow the darkness would make it more acceptable. Somehow the darkness would somehow camouflage the fact that she was not really getting the thing he worked for, but he was getting some substitute, as it were. No doubt as the custom of the East was, the bride was veiled. She was concealed behind this covering. It might have been camo, camouflage, I don't know. This is the devil's tactic always, to veil reality, promise you one thing, then give you another. Because no one, listen to me, no one ever intentionally marries Leah. Laman knew that. He knew he could not get anybody to ever marry. She had never had a date. She had never had a corsage. She never had a box of candy. She never had a phone call from a boy. He knew the only way he would ever get her married, he would have to trick a man to get this girl married to have a husband. You get intoxicated with the promise of something beautiful and how you think life is going to be. And then in the morning, there is the Leah of heartache and shattered dreams and a broken heart. Everybody will experience the Leah of trials and tests and, and disappointments and broken dreams and false hopes and desperate hours of tears and fears. And you go to the kitchen of pain and have to lick every plan and sleepless nights and dark days of depression. Things go wrong in your life because very few things ever work out like you think it should but I want to give this ray of light and hope that Jacob never divorced her he never abandoned her he never forsook her he never walked out on her he never deserted her but he endured the hardship and he was faithful and he stuck it out and he suffered through it and I'm glad for Jacob that he did not abandon her what can I do brother Osborne well, you cannot rewrite history. How can I undo it? It cannot be undone. What has been done has been done. What has been written has been written. The answer to that question is you can't change and rewrite history. But here is your hope. The reality is that Leah produced more children for Jacob than Rachel ever did. Let me say it again. Are you listening? Leah produced more children for Jacob than Rachel ever did. I can look back over my own life, and I must confess to you this day that Leah's of disappointment, hurt, and pain, Leah's of broken dreams and broken hearts and wasted time, Leah's of frustration and depression and shattered expectations, Leah's of canceled plans and lies and, and beguiling spirits and false hope, Leah's of tiredness and weariness and pain and frustration times. All this brought me closer to the Lord and made me pray and made me seek God. It showed me how fickle and deceiving life can be and how much I needed the Holy Ghost in my life. Leah makes you know how much you need God. Leah doesn't teach, Rachel doesn't teach you very much. But, but Leah will keep you on your knees. Leah will drive you to the altar. Leah will keep you awake at night and seek the face of God for understanding. So I'm telling you, don't divorce Leah. Don't walk away. Don't abandon her on the side of the road. So she's going to give birth to something in your life that Rachel could never give birth to. Because pain and suffering and heartache and despair and broken dreams and false hopes all are parents of greatness in the lives of men who will endure them to the end. Lift your hands and love the Lord just a moment, would you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Be seated. Just a little bit more. Leah exposes your weakness, and she will break your heart, but it's the very thing that tends to draw you to God. Satan meant it for evil, but God meant it for good that much people might be through the Leah of your experience. The Bible said, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. It's very short-lived, it's very empty of value, and it's very superficial. The Rachels of life don't offer you very much very long because they're very short-lived. They're very empty, they're hollow, they have very little value, and they're all superficial. But Leah will go straight to the heart. She goes straight to the bone of your life. You may dream about Rachel in the night, but how will it be when the morning comes? 
Because more encounters with Jesus are brought about by Leah than have ever been brought about by Rachel. Issues of blood and laying by pool for 38 years and blind and begging by the Jericho Road. On your way to the cemetery to bury your only son. Going through a storm, being in a well. Hallelujah, been married five times, now living with a man. Legion naked, cutting himself, crying, living among the tombs. The thief on the cross, remember me. These are all the Leahs of life that draw people to God, that bring people to the altar, that cause you to be serious about your life and give up the superficial and give up that that has no lasting endurance. From Leah, the one he hated, the one he despised came six sons and one daughter because Leah gave birth to Reuben. It means a, it means a vision of the son. Somehow, when you get married to Leah, she'll open your eyes and let you see things you had never seen before. She'll let you see people and hurts. She'll let you see pains because you've already walked through that valley. Now your eye, because some people, they look at somebody's heart broke because their heart's never been broken. They'll pack their Bible up and go out the door. I passed her for 42 years, and I know a little something about people being in church. But I'll tell you, when your heart gets broke, it'll give you compassion for someone else's broken heart. It'll make you come down and pray with a mother whose child is lost when you have a lost child you've got to go through it to have some compassion she says I gave birth to something and opened my eyes it gave me vision Rachel never opened uh, Rachel never opens your eyes to anything but Leah will give an eye-opening experience to you she give birth to Simeon that means that is heard she'll open your ears and let you hear things you'll hear the still small voice of God Rachel Rachel has a lot of laughter a lot of there's a there's an old old poem that I he said, I walked a mile with laughter. And she chattered. You can say, I walked a mile with Rachel. And she chattered all the way. But I was none the wiser for all she had to say. Then I walked a mile with Leah, and never a word spake she. But oh, the things I learned from her when Leah walked with me. Rachel can walk with you, and you'll laugh and have a great time. But when it's over with, it's over with. But when Leah and sorrow and heartache walks with me, she don't have to say a word. But oh, the things I learned from her. She opened my eyes. She unstopped my ears to hear things I could have never heard. Without that experience, can you believe that locked up in this little girl that no one, because see, the Bible could not go on until this girl was married. There's no sense in writing another word until you get her married. Because in, in her is Levi, which is the priesthood. The entire priesthood is locked up in a little girl that nobody wants. And so if you're going to talk about the tabernacle, if you're going to talk about, you going to talk about connection with God, if you're going to talk about an altar, if you talk about a labor, if you talk about golden candlesticks, talk about showbread, you talk about a veil being rent, if you talk about an ark of the covenant, put it on hold because we got a little ugly girl that nobody wants to marry. And she's got the priesthood locked up inside of her. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Who knows what's locked up inside your hurt? Who knows what's locked up inside of your pain? God may have intercession locked up in you. You can't intercede until you've been through something. You had some experience with it. Then there's intercession. Then there's intercession. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'll do one more. Locked up inside of her was Judah. <laughs> Locked up inside of her was a lion <laughs> coming out of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Pentecost put it on hold. Matthew, you've got nothing to say yet. Because we've got to get a little girl married over here first. Because she's got the Messiah locked up inside of her. She's got the Savior of the entire world locked up inside of a girl that a man hated that was married to her. I'm married to a girl that I hate, but she's got my Savior locked up inside of her. So in order for me to be saved, God, can you even wrap yourself around it for a moment? It's hard for me for your Savior to be wrapped up in something you hated. That the thing that could be the Savior of your soul could be locked up in something that was ugly and painful and hurtful and deceptive. It was a lie. It was trickery. And yet God ordained that the Savior of the world would be locked up in something that nobody wanted. Nobody wanted it. She got the Levitical priesthood. She's got the eye opening. She got the ear unstopping. 
And she's got the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ of God, the anointed one. God robed in flesh, locked up in a little girl that no man wanted, that a man had to be tricked into marrying just to get the Savior out. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your life is like. But whatever you're going through may be the means of your saving. It may be the thing that saves you. I mean, Satan meant it for evil. He meant to kill you with it. But if you won't divorce it and you'll embrace it, it may be that that saves you. It may open your eyes and stop your ears and be that that intercedes in your behalf like Levi. It ministers between you and God. Type of the Holy Ghost would minister for you and it would be the means of your salvation as long as you don't drop it off beside the road or abandon it. You know, you've got to let the blemish lamb live. Just because it's blemished doesn't mean you kill it. When they brought a lamb in before the priest, he had to examine it thoroughly. It, 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 it could have something superficial and it couldn't be used. It could have a mole and it couldn't be used. It could have a wind and it couldn't be used. It could have a split hoof it couldn't be used. It could have a spot. It could, some things weren't obvious. He'd run his hands over the wool. He had to feel all around. And so he said, whoop, 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 whoop. Something here. Something here. Something's wrong. What would, he, would he just kill it because it was no good? No, he'd put it back in the fold. Because who knows? There were very few spotless lambs, by the way. A little Baptist nod would be good right here. Very few spotless lambs. Very, 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 very few spotless lambs. For such were some of you. So the Bible said, very, very few spotless lambs. So you put the spotless lamb back in the fold because who knows what might come from a spotless lamb. Somewhere down the road, somewhere down the time, a couple of spotless lambs might get together and gender together and make a spotless lamb. So if you kill all the spot, spotted, if you kill all the blemished lambs, you'll decimate the flock to the point there'll be nothing left to gender. So I said, let Rahab live. I know she's spotted. I know Jericho all hated her for being a home wrecker, but let her live. Because she married a man named Salmon, S A L M O N. The Bible said they dwelt in Jerusalem or dwelt in Israel until this time. You know what? They had a son named Boaz. Let the little girl from Moab let her live. Let the little girl from Moab, because she's cursed, she's a product of incest, so let, let her live. Just let that blemished lamb live. Let her live, because she's going to come back to Bethlehem. She's going to come back to the house of bread with Naomi, you know. She's going to come back, and, 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 and she's going to fall in love with Boaz. Now, they're going to have some great kids, you know that. They're going to have some great kids, because she's the product of incest, and he's, his, his mother's a harlot. So what are their kids going to be? What are the chances their kids ever mount to anything? But let them live. Let, don't kill them because they're, they're obviously blemished. They're never going to be perfect. It's obvious from their lives they are imperfect and will never be perfect. But let them live. Because they had a son named Obed. And Obed had a son named Jesse. And Jesse had a son named David, which is the son of David that takes away the sins of the world. So I said, you need to let the blemished lamb live. It may not be perfect, but out of them may come something glorious. So when blemishes come into your life, it does, go ahead and stand. It doesn't need to be fatal. When blemishes come into your life, I said, let them live. Let it live. Let it live. Embrace it. It may produce the Savior of your life. It may save your soul. It may save your soul. Hallelujah. 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 Lift your hands and love the Lord with me right now. Would you love you, Lord? I love you, Lord. 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 I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know any of you. I don't know what your life is like. I don't know where you've been or what your struggles have been. But I know there are folks in here that have just, it seems like you just woke up and there it was. I mean, you never dated it. It wasn't on your calendar. You didn't plan it. You were not part nor parcel of what happened. You just woke up one day, and it was Leah. And there you are. And you hate it, and rightfully so. You hate what has happened. 
You hate what has happened. Because that's it wasn't a part of your future. You had not planned on this being a part of your life. But there it is anyway. There it is. And what we need to do this morning is to embrace our lives and say, God, work this for your glory. Because it may open your eyes, unstop your ears, and save your soul. And when it's all said and done, listen to me, I'm close. When it's all said and done, and Jacob was with his boys, and he charged them and said, I'm gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is the field of Ephraim the Hittite, in the cave that is the field of Michpelah, which is in Mamre in the land of Canaan. And Abraham bought with the field of Ephraim the Hittite for possession of a burying place. And there they buried Abram, Sarah, his wife. And there I buried Isaac, Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. He said, when I die, Bury me with Leah. Don't bury me with Rachel. She was beautiful. But Rachel never did really love me, but Leah loved me. So when I die, bury me with the thing I hated because it, it gave me life. It caused me to live, so bury me. When it's all said and done, you lift your hands in glory, and you'll say, thank you for the Leahs of my life. Just bury me with Leah. Bury me with the thing I hated because she's the one that saved my soul. She saved my life. She saved my life. We're going to sing. We're going to sing, and I want you to come if you've got Aaliyah in your life. We're just going to pray together, and I know it's hard. It's never been easy. We have struggles and hardships and heartache and despairs, and things go wrong in our lives that we have no way of knowing. You know, I had a stroke like your pastor, and uh, affected my right side. I couldn't write my name. I hadn't planned on that. I thought my life was over. I nearly went insane over that. As soon as I got over the stroke, I have an 18-year-old, 17-year-old daughter. She was the apple of my eye. She was, we took a newborn to our daughter, other daughter's college graduation. I may have told the story, but I'll tell it again. And she was 17 years old. My wife, she led our children's choir, children's church, wrote songs, played the piano. She was 17 years old. My wife got her ready for school, and uh, she went out the door, and we never saw her again. I found her car with the windows broken out. It was full of snow. I hadn't planned on that. No. She'll be 25 now if she's still alive. Her wife cries herself to sleep nearly every night. But it's the Leah we live with. And it's not easy. But everybody has one of some sort, of some kind, you know. It may not be that, but it's some kind. You know, some sort of pain or hurt. I'll tell you what, it's opened my eyes to other people's problems. Because sometimes people look at me and say, you don't even know. You don't even have no idea what it's like for this. You don't have no idea what it's like for that. You don't have no idea what I'm going through. And you're right, I don't have no idea. But then you don't have any idea about me either. So it's mutual. But I'll tell you what, it'll open your ears to other people's call. It'll open your eyes to other people's situation. And it'll help you have mercy and be kind to people. Don't be mean. Don't be a mean person. Be kind to people. Because you never know what you might wake up with tomorrow. Somebody's been divorced, you be kind. You be kind. Because nobody's exempt from troubles and hardships and brokenness and pain. And when you go through something, it will open your eyes and your hurts and your minds and your spirit. I want you to come down and get behind these people. They need some folks here to lay their hands on. We're going to pray for them this morning. If you know the Lord and maybe you've been through it, maybe you've had a Leah in your life, you ought, to, you ought to have your ears open to their cry and their tears ought to have some impact and in effect on your life because we're going to pray. What are we going to say? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to believe God with you this morning that God's going to touch your life in ways that will be strong and will help you endure to the end. Help you be faithful to God because...